بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله نرحب بالجميع First of all I would like to thank all our attendants with us tonight in the second annual diabetes symposium on behalf of uh, academic affairs uh, Saudi German Hospital Asir region I would like to welcome all and uh, as you know, it, our uh, symposium it is parallel with the World Day, uh, World Diabetes Day. Uh, and as you know, this year it is under labels of education to prevent, uh, to protect tomorrow, uh, which highlight uh, the most uh, important uh, opportunity to uh, strengthen the prevention, diagnosis, and uh, treatment of uh, diabetic. Uh, today, we have distinguished speakers. As, uh, as we mentioned last night, uh, we will have three sessions, inshallah. Uh, we will start with uh, diabetic and renal disease. Then after that, uh, we'll talk about diabetic with the psychological impact. And finally, we have a special talk with the, uh, our distinguished dermatologist uh, regarding the cutaneous manifestations of diabetes. Uh, let us uh, to welcome our uh, speakers tonight. Uh, tonight we have uh, Dr. Mohammed Al Shihri. He is adult nephrologist, and he is assistant professors of internal medicines and nephrology, uh, College of Medicine, King Khalid University. And uh, after that, also we have our uh, speaker, Dr. Abdul Aziz Al Garni. He is a consultant psychiatrist. Uh, also assistant professors of uh, psychiatry, College of Medicine, King Khalid University. And also we have Dr. Yahya al Urgubi, he is associated professor of dermatologist, uh, King Khalid University, College of Medicine. And he is the secretary general for Saudi Society for uh, Medical Education. Uh, I would like to, uh, well, uh, to get opportunity for Dr. Uh, Mohammed to start his talk tonight. I hope all attendees can hear me and Dr. Mohammed uh, as well. Uh, welcome, Dr. Mohammed. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ayyaka Allah, Dr. Mohammed. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And the mics for you. Okay. Okay. Shukran, uh, Dr. Safar Muqaddima. Taiba. And uh, thank you all for the uh, invitation. Uh, okay, so I start my screen sharing. Yeah. Bismillah. So um, I think uh, this is very important topic to to talk about because diabetes is uh, is very common in, uh, worldwide and it's uh, also very common in Saudi Arabia. And when it comes to kidney disease. Um, uh, most of, if not all of our patients that we start in dialysis are actually have some sort of uh, advanced diabetes. So my talk today will be, uh, I'll try to make it practical. So how to approach patients with um, with the diabetes and CKD and what we can do to uh, delay the progression of the of the CKD. And this is actually the the main target we have when we, uh, when we manage uh, uh, CKD in diabetic patients. So... Um, I have nothing to uh, disclose. Um, it's interesting. I was when I was preparing this, I found uh, this interesting uh, uh, text from uh, Ibn Sina or Rafshina, they call it in Latin. Uh, he was describing uh, uh, diabetes. Uh, for some reason, I think the uh, translation, uh, the name was not diabetes or Adina Itas or something. So, uh, the definition was so it's 
there is a there is a link between uh, diabetes and um, and uh, and kidney disease from the old times. Uh, so my objectives today is uh, I'll be talking about definitions and significance, diagnosis and screening, and uh, what cause uh, what the mechanism behind diabetes kidney disease, and uh, general consideration to for primary healthcare um, uh, specifically. Uh, so definition of CKD, it's um, abnormality of the kidney structure or function. Um, when we say function, we mean GFR is less than 60. So for more than three months. So if you have a patient with either structural or functional abnormality for more than six months, you call it uh, CKD. So, and if you see this is Kidigu uh, criteria for CKD, it's actually, you could, you could have uh, albuminuria um, with normal GFR and you still call it CKD. If you have, for example, cystic disease, but with normal GFR, you, you still call it CKD. And uh, here, here, this is the classification that is based on two things, on based on the GFR on the right side and based on albuminuria in the top side here. So as, as you go to the right side and you go down, the chance to go into SRD is high. Do you, do you see my mouse, the uh, my indicator or pointer? Yes, this okay. okay, good. So when you move down and right side, you actually the chance of going to end the stage of disease is, uh, is very high. So most of our patients, and I think most of your patients also in the primary health care, they are usually in this range from 60, um, uh, from 30 to 60 of GFR, if we, if we calculate the GFR. Okay, what is diabetic nephropathy? Diabetic nephropathy is based on three things. Either you have albuminuria, or for whatever reason, you had the kidney biopsy and the kidney biopsy shows uh, diabetic uh, lesions, or you have a GFR less than 30 in diabetic patient. These three things, one of them actually, uh, it's, um, it's a definition of uh, diabetic nephropathy in diabetic patient. So the question, could a patient have diabetic nephropathy with normal creatinine is definitely yes especially albuminuria, which is the most common cause of diabetes, or I would say the most common presentation of uh, diabetic nephropathy. It can be actually with normal, with normal creatinine. And this is, this is very nice uh, um, uh, figure from, it shows the major uh, diabetic uh, nephropathy data, databases. And you can see, for example, if you take this middle one, you see GFR is low in around 4% only, like GFR was only in 4%, while 42% have albuminuria with normal GFR. And here you can see there is a patient with 19% of patients have albuminuria, while just around 10% have uh, GFR less than 60. And, and this is so on. So you can have the, the what, what I'm trying to show from this is albuminuria, it's very common in diabetic patients. So what we need to, 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 to do is to, to look for it and try to find it early. So it is 30 to 40 percent of patients with diabetic have a diabetic nephropathy. It's most common cause of uh, chronic kidney disease around the world. And CKD per se, it's a major contributor to mortality and morbidity in, in diabetic patients. So if you see, this is, this is very, um, very illustrative uh, to, to show us how, how bad is albuminuria and impaired GFR. So if you have, uh, this is shows 10 year mortality and percent. So if you have albuminuria and impaired GFR, the chance of death in 10 years is almost 50%. While if you compare it with patient with no kidney disease, around 4%. This is, if you have albuminuria only, it's around three, four times the, um, the chance of, of death in 10 years, even if you have normal GFR. Um, that's why in, in, kid, in nephrology world, albuminuria or proteinuria, it's actually an important surrogate for, for, uh, for, uh, for following or measuring or, or uh, treating the uh, kidney disease in general. Okay, so the problem we, we face, and I think all of you have, have been through this, you, you start to see patients very, very late. Um, so we diagnose diabetes very late. And this is the one problem uh, on this triangle. And... The other problem is there is a delayed diagnosis in diabetic nephropathy. So we have patients with diabetes for a long, long period of time, and nobody is looking for them and finding um, they have uh, diabetic kidney disease or not. 
And once, even after we di diagnose patient with diabetic nephropathy, we actually not doing great job by starting the guidelines um, uh, medication that actually now it's uh, um, getting better actually in the last few years. So what happens if all of this is there? We have a high high mortality, rapid progression to endocardial disease, higher cost and admission rate, and it's. If you go, let's uh, let's go to one of the uh, central hospitals in the area, Asir, for example. All of a sudden, we have patients in the emergency with a creatinine of 10, and they have diabetes for 10 years, and they don't know they have a kidney disease, and they start dialysis like all of a sudden. And they, they would be surprised because they nobody told them um, uh, that they have kidney disease before. So this is from American Diabetic Association. They... It's very clear in all guidelines, I would say, of diabetes that you should check your albumin every year for diabetic patient. Uh, it might be later for type 1 diabetes, but in type 2 diabetes, at time of diagnosis, you should check your albumin to creatine ratio or any sort of albuminuria, and also to check uh, GFR. And if a patient have significant uh, albuminuria, you should check twice yearly and also GFR should be checked uh, twice here. We have GFR less than less than um, less than four, less than sixty. Are we doing this actually? No. So if you if you see this is a this is a data from um, from um, uh, big data bases that is was collected. You see almost uh, one and a half million patients, and only thirty five percent um, of the patients have albumin to creatine ratio was checked in less than forty. And uh, I'm sure we are doing much. Worse than this. So, how to calculate GFR? So, I'm 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 mentioning this because I get a lot of uh, questions from residents and sometimes from friends in primary healthcare about how to uh, estimate GFR because most of the our systems or labs they don't actually report GFR in the labs. They just report creatine. And if you don't see it in front of your eyes, you cannot you cannot. Um, uh, like um, uh, appreciate how, how bad is the disease. So there is two ways of uh, calculating GFR, either estimate the GFR by having serum creatinine, which is the most common one, or cyst serum cystatin C, which is not the common one, but you can do it sometime if you think the creatinine is not accurate for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. It's available in Al-Burj uh, here in Abha, and you can use it if you have a young patient with unexplained lipid serum creatinine and you think maybe this is just because muscle mass is high or something like that. You can check serum creatinine C and, and calculate GFR based on it. And what all you need to do, just go to Google and Google CKD ABI. And actually I'm choosing CKD ABI equation because it's most, this is, I would say most accurate one, there's another like uh, calculation and equations, but uh, it's better to stick with this one because it, it's the easiest one. And uh, the major GFR, we don't do it. It's only a research, research setting. And once you go there, so you just click 2021 CKD ABI creatinine and check the six and you put the age and then uh, the creatinine. So, and you can see the difference between male and the female. For example, the same serum creatinine, same age, uh, GFR in, in this patient has female 61, while in uh, male patient 81. It's adjusted for, for, for the gender. Okay, so as I mentioned, you check cystatin C if you think GFR is uh, the creatinine is falsely high for whatever reason, patient high protein intake, uh, muscle mass, or opposite, if a patient has low creatinine and you think the patient have CKD, but they have uh, low muscle mass, so you can check it as well. Okay, how you check proteinuria? We have this is this is a common thing. You, you all of you, if you know this with the urine dip stick, you basically uh, dip a, like a stick in there and give you this color and ca like will give you idea if this patient have a, a, a proteinuria or no. And this is a quantitative test. It, sorry, it's qualitative test. It's not quantitative. It, it does not tell you exactly how much protein in this, and you need to repeat it uh, to make sure what is the, uh, what is the amount of protein in the urine. So how can we do um, quantitative measurement? You have two ways, either albumin to creatine ratio uh, or 24-hour urine collection. Um, the, the urine albumin to creatine ratio is easy, spot urine, sample, practical, more common. All you need is just to go to the system and order urine protein, sorry, urine albumin or urine, and urine creatinine, and then you divide the urine 
albumin bioiron creatine and give you the ratio. If it's one, for example, it gives you this is about one gram of uh, protein uh, uh, in 24 hours. It correlates very well with 24 hour urine collect collection. And most of the GN diseases, there is some exception, but uh, diabetes, diabetes is not one of them. 24 hour, you do it if you're in doubt and you feel there is something wrong with the urine albumin to creatine ratio. Okay, so again, why we are doing very bad job uh, when it comes to screening. And I think this is based on my personal experience. I think one of them is system issue in primary health care system. Um, the GFR is not there. So if you order creatinine, it does not give you GFR. And um, sometimes urine and urine protein and urine albumin and urine creatine is not there, so you cannot order it. And the other thing is there is a huge gap, which I, I noticed that in resident. There is a huge gap between what they know and what they are doing. And um, and I don't know, I don't know exactly why, but there is a huge gap. You know, they, they are very good theoretically, but when it comes to patient care, they they basically don't know what they should do exactly to check this or that. And uh, patient education is zero, which is, I think we all agree on this because this is every time I'm on call in Asir, we will have a patient, all of a sudden they come to uh, to the emergency with a creatine of 10 and fatigue and specific symptoms. And when you tell them, have you checked your um, uh, labs before? They say, no. And did anyone tell you you have a kidney disease? They might say, yes, this is about five years ago. They told me I have amlah which is very, very bad the description for, for acute, for uh, chronic kidney disease and uh, lack of good referral system. So if you have a patient in primary health care and you refer, you refer this patient to, to, um, to, let's say, nephrology clinic or a diabetic center, there is no way you can track them and be, uh, see what happens. Uh, so let's, let's take this case. You, you are a consultant for two 33-year-old male patient presented to you with serum creatine 1.8 milligram per deciliter and GFR of 50 ml per minute. Okay, this is two patients, exact age, exact GFR, exact serum creatine. And the first one has actually, the first patient has um, the only difference that patient A has 900 milligram protein in the urine while the patient B have no protein in the urine. So the question is who will go to dialysis faster? So, and I think all you know, this the patient with proteinuria will go to dialysis much faster. Okay, and you can see this, this proteinuria, proteinuria is very, very bad. And uh, it's worse than serum creatine, worse than GFR, it's worse than anything. And you can see here diabetic patients, you go and you see albumin, urine albumin to creatine ratio. It's when it starts to go up GFR, Go start to go down, and here it's actually go down because there is no GFR. Here they go down here because no GFR, so you cannot excrete anything. But this is the major thing when when albumin to creatine ratio goes up, the GFR goes down very significantly. And this is also this is very illustrative uh, figure. You can see here, here if you start at zero point, let's say start zero point, and you have three classes of patients. You have patients with uh, three gram of uh, proteinuria or albuminuria, and you have patient more than 1.5, but less than three gram, and you have group of patient less than 1.5 gram. So you can see the difference between the two extremes. So patient more than three gram at 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 uh, 48 months, which is four years, 80 percent will be on dialysis, while only around 15 percent with patient with less than less than 1.5 uh, gram, around like. 10 person they will be on dialysis. And I will tell you 1.5 gram is too, too high for proteinuria and we should not have that. Mm -hmm. So more proteinuria at faster progression to, to end the serial disease. So, but we should keep in mind that patient with diabetes still might have something else. So if you have patient with rapid progressive decline in GFR, this is not typical to, to to diabetes or diabetic kidney disease. If you have rapid increase in proteinuria, this is also not typical for, for diabetic kidney disease. Same with RBC in the urine. So in, in, in patient with diabetes, typically it's pure nephrotic disease. Now there is, should not, that we should not have nephritic presentation. We should not have RBC in the urine. If you see RBC in the urine in diabetic patient, you should look for something else. And if you don't have retinopathy, especially in the in type one diabetes, should think about something else, uh, not um, not um, not only um, uh, uh, diabetes. So if you have 
patient with diabetes and have one of these uh, atypical presentation, you should refer them to uh, nephrology for possibility of kidney biopsy to know what's going on exactly. And this is very interesting um, uh, report when this is meta-analysis. Actually, in some report, up to 80% of patients, of diabetic patients who have kidney biopsy, they have something else. I think this is a very high number, but um, it just gives you an idea. It's not when you have patients with diabetes that with a kidney disease, you should think about something else as well. So most common causes usually IgA or membrane cephalopathy and both autoimmune disease and um, autoimmune disease and diabetes actually they are uh, like like each other. So this is another case. You have a 44, 45 year old male patient present to your clinic for uh, for um, first time. Uh, creatine is two milligram per deciliter and proteinuria three point five gram per gram. The patient is diabetic since he was 15 years old, and he admit that he has just recently started to take care of his diabetes. He has several eye injections for diabetic nephropathy. So you have a patient, uh, long-standing diabetes, uh, brought, he has nephrotic rage in proteinuria, not taking care of himself, and he has retinopathy. So the question is, would you would you do kidney biopsy for this patient? And I think I think in this scenario, you should not, because when you do kidney biopsy, it's most likely it's most likely diabetes. In the other scenario, if we have 55 year old male patient present to the hospital with fatigue, creatinine 3.5 baseline uh, months ago around 1.2 milligram per deciliter, has proteinuria 5 gram, which is nephrotic range of proteinuria. Urea microscopy shows RBCs. He has very well controlled diabetes in three years with no complication. In in this scenario, I would push for kidney biopsy because this patient might have something else. It's not only diabetes. Okay, so what's causing diabetic kidney disease? So it's actually, this is very, I'm not a scientist. Um, we are all, I think we are all clinician, but um, it could be, there is a several mechanism, maybe react to oxygen free radical thing. And the other thing is bodocyte uh, dysfunction. And you you will hear this a lot, bodocyte dysfunction. Bodocyte are these cells that actually um uh, are major component of uh, the GPM or uh, glomerular basement membrane. And if you have dysfunction in, in bodocyte for whatever reason, usually you will have proteinuria. And the other thing, inf inflammatory cell recruitment. There is, there is something going on causing the inflammatory cell to be recruited to the glomeruli and causing fibrosis and inflammation. And uh, I think this is very, very um, one of the most common um, um, uh, mechanism that we talk about usually is increased pressure in the glomeruli inside the glomeruli. And you, if you imagine, this is the efferent arteriole entering the glomeruli and it's leaving. So if you, if the pressure is high here, the pressure will be high here. So for if you do something to block or decrease the flow here, what will happen inside? The pressure will decrease. And the same time, if you do whatever to dilate this, this uh, arteriole, the pressure will decrease here. And this is actually basically the mechanism of uh, ACE or ARB and SGLT2 inhibitors. So um, this is just to um, uh, show you one of the mechanisms. So you have hyperglycemia, and this will increase the tubular glucose to macula densa, this area. And this increase nitric oxide to this area and will lead to vasodilation with afferent arterioles. And vasodilation will cause higher GFR and also higher pressure in the glomeruli. And, and, and this is one of the common things in, in, uh, in, uh, in, diabetic, in diabetic kidney disease. They have hyperfiltration. In the beginning of the diabetic nephropathy, they have normal creatine, maybe low creatine in the beginning because they have high, high GFR, higher than normal. So all of these nitric oxide and trigonomial pressure and react to oxygen, inflammation, bodocyte inflammation, endothelial injury, all, all of them will lead to the final product, which is tubular interstitial fibrosis and, uh, and gradual nephron loss. So what we should do, we have this uh, enemy that we have to, to fight and tackle. So when you have a CKD, which is diabetic nephropathy, the CKD basically, your target is to detect early and detect early here and do everything you can to, to delay the progression to endostatic disease. So blood pressure control, proteinuria, decrease salt intake, A1C, decrease the acute kidney injury by whatever you can and change lifestyle. 
And I think this is not only in diabetic, this is in all CKD, not only in diabetic nephropathy. If you can, if you can do this, actually, you might prevent dialysis and patient will have a good life with no dialysis or transplantation. So uh, this is actually from Kidigo Guidelines 2022. They just published recently for uh, managing uh, diabetes in CKD patient. And you can see it must be a holistic approach. It starts from down from here, diet, exercise, smoking station, and the weight loss. And then these are major thing, which is statin, ras blockade. When we say ras blockade, meaning we are trying to add uh, add um, ACE or ARB to the management and SG2 inhibitors, which is which is big one now. It's uh, the new kid in the block, and everyone should should be every diabetic patient should be on this medication. And some medication might need a nanosteroid, a mineralocorticoid antagonist. We'll talk about it briefly later. And GLB-1 also, it's uh, one of the medications proven to, to decrease proteinuria. And if we have longer uh, trials, it might also decrease the rate of uh, uh, kidney disease or uh, endothelial disease. Okay, so this is, this is um, just to give you the correlation between how high A1C and microalbuminuria. If you have A1C of 12, the chance of proteinuria is very high or microalbuminuria. This is, this is um, I, you cannot rely on that as a causation, but it's just, there is association. You can see the association between, if you have, let's say six uh, microgram, um, six uh, A1C, the, uh, you have around like uh, one, one gram of uh, microalbuminuria or person, sorry. Okay. So, the, I think I, I mentioned albuminuria again and again and again, and albuminuria is your enemy. It should be your enemy. And either a patient or a physician, you should focus on the albuminuria more than focusing on the on the creatinine per se. Again, this is I, I like this chart and I like to share it with the resident student, and I'm sharing it with you now because I feel it's very representative for what we're talking about. If you have high proteinuria, you have a higher chance to go into dialysis. If you have lower proteinuria, you have lower chance to go into dialysis. Okay, so what we should do, if you have a patient now, diabetic kidney disease, or I, I would say diabetes, and you did the screening as, as we all should do, and you find albuminuria. So if you have patient hypertension, so it's easy just to start ACE and RB and start to follow up. If you have a patient with normal tensive, Again, start ACE and ARP. And some might not agree with me, but please do it because this is what you can do to prevent the progression of kidney disease. And even in the, the last guidelines and the kidney guidelines, they say you may, you may consider starting ACE or ARP on patients with high normal tension and patient not hypertensive. And I think this is just to mention, this is very old and very agreed on practice in all nephrology. We start ACE and ARB in every patient with albuminuria, regardless of the cause. This is either membranous of pathy, minimal chain disease, whatever the cause, even if the patient is normal tensive. So we should do it. And recheck metabolic, metabolic profile in two weeks. You just make sure there is no hyperkalemia and there is no acute kidney injury. And, um, and, uh, Again, why you should, this is just, I, I put this to remind myself, why we should start this? Because actually, even the hypertension guidelines changing every year, like five years ago, the target was 140 over 90, and now it's 120, the target over 80. So it's changing. So a few years ago, you might, if you have a patient with blood pressure 130, you would say this is hypertensive, and now you cannot, and now, you, sorry, you say it's not hypertensive, now you can say the patient is hypertensive based on some of the guidelines. Okay, so what about starting ACE inhibitors and DRB at the same time? Uh, this is, you should not do this because it's increased just, it's, it's just harmful and does not help. Um, it's actually just increased the, the, the rate of hyperkalemia and, uh, and uh, the hypotension without adding a benefit to the, to the patient. Okay, so here is a very, very nice chart from the Kidigo guidelines. So you initiate ACE inhibitor ARB, and then you check serum creatinine and potassium in two to four weeks. And this is, again, this is not a practice that we're doing. 
we do it all the time and send patients home and they will not check it for, for forever. So if you have more than 30% increase in creatinine, you should try to find why that is happening. Is the patient diuretic, high dose diuretic? The patient has renal artery stenosis. The patient have other medication. The patient not drinking enough. If there is less than 30% increase in creatinine, let's say if you start with the creatinine of one, okay, and after two weeks, you find creatinine 1.3, should you stop? No, you should continue. And this is actually a sign that the medication is working because you're decreasing the pressure inside the glomeruli. And by increasing the pressure inside the glomeruli, actually you are decreasing the GFR and the creatinine will go up uh, slightly. Okay, so this is the new hope that actually came um, uh, several years ago. And um, the story of um, linking between the cardiovascular benefit and kidney benefit with this medication was very interesting because it was um, sudden, like they found they found it without planning, basically. In, in FDA in 2008, they, they say, if you are doing any sort of trials in diabetic patients, you should report cardiovascular mortality and you should uh, report myocardial infarction and the stroke. And that time, we started to notice these medications decrease these things significantly. And uh, that's when the, when the, when the SGLT2 inhibitors change from hypoglycemic medication to something else, to the, like to cardioprotective and renoprotective and, uh, and the stroke protective and, uh, and, and other things that you all know about. So these medications, they are diuretics. So when you prescribe them, just keep in mind they are diuretics and they work in the proximal area of the nephron where the most of the absorption happen and they are there more than 150 years and they have both the effect regarding a1c even if you have normal glycemic patients you should start it in diabetic patients with albuminuria with no question um sodium glucose transport inhibitors so when you when you initiate it you have to consider several things patient selection Patient must have GFR more than 20. And they have the um, albumin to creatine ratio is to more than 200. And actually, if you if you look at the MBA kidney trials um, um, that came actually uh, several weeks ago, the benefit of this medication actually the, is actually um, was not that significant in patients with no albuminuria. And um, just, just keep in mind genital infection and diabetic ketoacidosis we call it euglycemic diabetic acid. So they will come to the emergency with normal, with acidosis and normal glucose. And we have seen several cases of this. So just keep in mind, they might it might cause this uh, um, uh, complication. Foot ulcer, and uh, foot ulcer actually it's not, it's not um, consist like not consistent in all trials. The old trials was there is some risk of foot ulcer, but all the trials that came after, there was no no um, significant uh, uh, increase in patients to have a foot ulcers. And uh, sick day protocol, if a patient is getting sick, diarrhea or vomiting, you should, they sh should skip medication and they should uh, hold it prior to the, um, to the, uh, to the any surgery. So again, if you start these medic medications, you should keep in mind the GFR might drop. And this is actually a good sign. If GFR drops slightly, this is a good sign that the medication is, uh, is working. And you can start, if you can see this, this is the embagliflozin. This is the zero point, And you see embagliflozin initially, the GFR dropped. But at the end, the GFR actually was bitter. And this is again in the embagliflozin trial, the same thing happens. And in uh, canagliflozin trials, and the same thing happens. And the initially, GFR should drop, and this normal, this you should you should be just uh, relaxed and okay, and you should um, assure the patient that should be um, this is just temporary thing and should should uh, should uh, should improve with time. Okay, so don't discontinue, just continue. And I, one of my mentors they would say, if you don't see the GFR dropping down, this is not a good sign. You might need to increase the dose. Okay, and why GFR drops? Because again. Um, RAS inhibition, which is a renal aldosterone system inhibition, works here in efferent. And why is SGLT inhibitor works here? So if you if you do some vasodilation here, the pressure here will decrease. And when the pressure here decreases, GFR will go down. 
and the same thing happens. So if you combine these two medication, as we know, or or not, mostly, if not all the trials of SGLT2 inhibitors, patient required to be on the maximum safe dose of uh, ACE or uh, ACE or ARB. So you should you should keep that in mind. Okay. So again, uh, renal aldosterone system work here. Uh, in general, like uh, ACE inhibitor in general, and also the uh, ARB works here in different YSGL2 inhibitor by, by indirect mechanism work here. Okay, so if you have patient who is like uh, glycemia, so if there is like a risk of hypoglycemia, you should, you should probably adjust the dose of sulfonuria or insulin. Um, if the patient have history of severe, of severe hypoglycemia, you should also think about adjusting the dose. And if the patient had folium depletion risk, a patient uh, on uh, diuretic use, folium status is not good, history of AKI, you should you should uh, you should very you should be careful. But regarding blood pressure, actually, there is no significant drop in the blood pressure when we add this medication to uh, to loop diuretics, for example. Okay, so here general consideration. If you have a patient with diabetic kidney disease, the first thing, uh, physical activity and nutrition and weight loss. And first line is you have metformin and SGL2 inhibitors. You should initiate uh, at the same time. You know, if you have GFR less than 30, you should not initiate, uh, SG, uh, sorry, if you have, um, uh, SG, this is old. If you have GFR less than 20, you should not initiate, but you can initiate more than 20. Metformin, if less than 30, you should not initiate uh, metformin, and you should decrease the dose of GFR less than 45. If these are not working, you should add GLB receptor agonist. This is this is actually a huge change in the guidelines. And what we are seeing actually in our practice is our patients are on sulfonuria, DDB4 inhibitors, and maybe metformin and some insulin. No one in SGL2 inhibitors, no one in GLB1 receptor agonist. I'm talking about CKD patients that we see in, in the in the in the CKD clinic. Okay, so this is, uh, I like to show this, and uh, I was showing this to the resident. You can see cetagliptin, which is our favorite uh, in, the, in the most primary care or also in CKD clinic because we know it's safe, it doesn't do anything, and actually it does not drop blood, pressure, blood sugar, and it does not help kidney. So it's actually, for me, it's as placebo. This medication looks like placebo. 40 bears of patient. They they have um, hemoglobin more than seven, and this is recent trial in in a, in a, a New England Journal of Medicine. So this medication doesn't work and doesn't help. It doesn't affect anything. Okay, this is GLB agonist. This is just uh, I think Dr. Ali covered uh, very well uh, yesterday the uh, the GLB agonist, and I think just to mention here, it's very safe even advanced CKD, even GFR less than twenty, uh, comparing with the SGLT2 inhibitors. So this is a new new kid in the block, non-steroidal MRI or non-steroidal mineral corticoid antagonist. And if you have the chance to work with experienced um, clinician or nephrologist, we actually have this old practice of adding cibranolactone, which is an altactone, to uh, for patient with adminuria. So this is not new. We know about this from 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 long time, and the evidence evidence has been there. So for example, this study it was a small trial, but they started with the with proteinuria of around two gram, and it goes down with aldactone to around like zero point seven. So the evidence has been there, but uh, aldactone there was no big trial to study aldactone on uh, on albuminuria or proteinuria, but um, it's common practice about uh, among the uh, experienced uh, uh, nephrologists. Um, so the side effect that we we. Mm -hmm. um, we try to avoid the gynecomastia in patient uh, in female in male patient and also uh, some uh, male uh, features in female and also it can cause hypotension and hyperkalemia. So why that's why actually we have a new guys we, they are phenerone and isaxironone. Uh, phenerone is has two trials and now it's in guidelines actually it's coming in the guideline and this is from kidigwag in guidelines it says we suggest an steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist with proof in kidney or cardiovascular benefit for patients with type 2 diabetes and gfr more than 25 normal serum potassium concentration and keep in mind they should have albuminuria and they should be on maximum dose of ras inhibitors so 
you, you we don't throw this as a first line. This is the second line. If you have a patient with these features and on maximum dose of RAS inhibitors, there is no data about patient on SGLT inhibitors. I mean, trials, SGLT inhibitor and these medications, but um, but uh, there is a sub like um, sub hoc analysis shows they maybe actually they are there is no different actually they are doing the same benefit and isex serenone I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this medication right this is approved for hypertension in Japan it's not approved yet in in uh, in, uh, in other countries but it's actually uh, has the same mechanism as serenone and they are both non steroidal and when we say non steroidal it does not cause the side effects it's caused by uh, spironolactone or aldactone. Okay, so a general consideration just to keep in mind when you're managing these patients. Um, if you have a patient with CKD or diabetic kidney disease, you check basic metabolic profile every year, if you have far more than 60. This is very clear in all guidelines. If the if the GFR less than 60, you should, should, you should check that every three to six months based on the severity. So if you have around 30, you should be more frequent. If it's more uh, around closer to 60, you should less frequent, but you should check it every every three to six months. Vitamin B12 monitoring should be checked for patients with a, a long-standing metformin around four years. You should keep in mind euglycemic, euglycemic decay with SG2 inhibitors and actually... I have several patients who came to the, to, to the hospital with a with a DK features, but no hyperglycemia. And we were thinking what's going on, and then we realized it's uh, it's actually one of the these new medications. And don't DC. Um, uh, sorry, when you when you reach a point of dialysis, you should stop because we think the benefit of SGLT inhibitors is mainly from the. Um, the urine, urinary like benefits. So if you don't make urine, the patient's not making urine, sorry. If the patient's not making urine, you should not, you should not keep going and giving these medications. Uh, there is also, so I will take it back, there is uh, trials going on for the patient and proteinia dialysis patient. There is some benefit, but there is still, this is under process. A1, A1C in advanced CKD might not be accurate. So if you have a patient with advanced CKD, and you think A1C is not, you think the patient is not controlled, or you see A1C is high or low for whatever reason, you should have more, uh, I would say, frequent monitoring at home, which is maybe more accurate than A1C. And uh, SGLT inhibitor and MRI are add on therapy, meaning patient should be on maximum dose of RAS inhibitor. And, uh, uh, and uh, I mean, RAS inhibitor, meaning um, uh, ACE inhibitor or ARP. Okay, target uh, of A1C in CKD patients. You can see the guidelines will say um, this is 6.5 to less than 8. And this is based, based on several things. And I think all you know about this, if a patient has severe CKD, you should not be uh, very aggressive about the A1C. If a patient has a history of uh, falls, history of hypoglycemia, uh, patient not able to take medication, cardiovascular disease, you should be less aggressive about the uh, A1C target. And again, I just mentioned that if you have CKD, there is high bias. If you have metabolic acidosis, it will give you hemoglobin A1C higher than uh, the, the, the reality. It will give you higher, uh, I would say, false positive high A1C. On the other hand, if you have anemia, transfusion, you have iron supplementation, and we know that in patients with CKD, they have a fat, like a short lifespan of, uh, of uh, RBCs and uh, that's why hemoglobin A1C will not be accurate. So that's why we probably need some time, either continuous glucose monitoring or more accurate or uh, accessible. It was the patient, ask the patient to check uh, blood sugar uh, more frequently at home. Okay, please, 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 if you are in primary health care, uh, consider early referral because this will change the life of the patient. If the patient is approaching dialysis, they, we should start talking about access, access formation, meaning, um, either fistula or BD, uh, peritoneal dialysis catheter. Better than patients crashing the emergency, we start with the catheter and we start with the, I mean, catheter like um, um, uh, central line catheter, which is not a good access and uh, modality selection. You have time. When you have a patient early, you have time to discuss with the patient if they like to start with a BD or start with a, I mean, PD, peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis or they might choose to start preemptive transplant, transplantation. They might have living donor. 
they might start uh, the process of transplantation even before hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. So the summary of everything, this is again, this is a holistic approach. Um, you need a, a good lifestyle, healthy diet, physical activity, smoking cessation, and first line therapy. I think metformin is, is, is still keeping the, the, the spot there. It's not, it's not leaving. And we don't know what's going to happen in the next few years. SGL2 inhibitors is now, uh, it's the it's first line in CKD patient. Again, if you have patient hypertension, I would say if you have patient albuminuria, if you have albuminuria, start RAS inhibitor, please. Don't wait for hypertension. You should start with low dose and check blood pressure, make sure you're not causing problems. But again, this we know albuminuria decre decreased by uh, RAS inhibitor. We don't need to wait for the guideline to tell us that. And uh, I, I, I don't need to go through this, but I think um, um, you need the blood pressure control and you need uh, antiplatelet agent for patients with uh, atherosclerotic, atherosclerotic um, uh, risk factors and uh, lipid uh, management as well. Okay, thank you. I think that's all. And I uh, hope I didn't talk uh, too much. Good afternoon, Dr. Mohammed. I'd like to thank you for this uh, simplified talk about uh, renal disease with uh, patient with diabetic. It is a huge talk, actually. I, I would like to thank you and uh, enforce your talk regarding the holistic approach and uh, keep the practice near to the guideline mission. This is this is your your uh, your role, doctor, as the nephrologist beside us uh, when you're dealing with diabetic patient. Uh, now I would like uh, thank you so much, Doctor uh, Mohammed. Uh, I would like now to invite Doctor uh, Abdul Aziz Al uh, Garni. He's our uh, psychiatrist. Uh, for 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 you, Doctor Doctor Abdul Aziz with us. نعم معكم بس I cannot share. خليني خليني الكو الهوست يمكن لانه كان الدكتور محمد قبل شوي اي ثينك يو كان يو كان تراي نو الظاهر لكم الان ولا؟ يس 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 فول سكرين يس ات از كلير ناو دكتور محمد يو كان ستارت Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you, Dr. Safar, for uh, you are welcome. And uh, also, I would like to thank Dr. Hassan and his team for organizing this symposium. And I'm glad to be a part of it. Uh, I will talk in the next 45 minutes about diabetes and psychological impact. Actually, the psychological part play a major uh, it play, it play a major role in depression uh, management. Uh, coping with the chronic disease, not easy, especially if you are talking about uh, diabetes. It's a huge topic. I will try in next few minutes to cover these items uh, or objectives, diabetes specific psychological problems, how diabetes causes mental health problems and how mental health problems may affect diabetes management and Finally, psychotropics medications with diabetic patient. I choose to talk about the more the five most common uh, diabetes uh, specific psychological problems, not accepting diabetes, coping with diabetes and diabetes uh, complications, diabetes burnout, fear of injections and blood glucose testing, and marital and family uh, problems. Also, with the five most common psychiatric illness related to diabetes. I will talk briefly about major depressive disorder and anxiety disorder, sleeping disorder, eating disorder, and sexual uh, disorder. Okay, so we'll start with diabetic, our diabetes, specific psychological problems. Not accepting diabetes. The diagnosis of diabetes is a live event that has been linked to the experience of grief. The same way it's unnatural to grieve for a lost loved one, the diagnosis of diabetes can trigger a grieving for a one's lost health. So it's the, this dramatically changes when diagnosed with a chronic health condition as uh, the person can become suddenly acutely aware that their life is not without limits. 
So they now have to rely, rely, rely on regular medications, changes to their lifestyles and so on. So this is the outline of uh, stages of grief. Uh, we should know it to know how to deal with it. Stage one, denial. This is cannot be happening. Stage two, anger, why me? Stage three, bargaining. They uh, would do anything to turn back time. Stage four, depression, and finally, acceptance. I'm trying to apply it to diabetic patients. So diabetic patients in the denial stage, he would, be, uh, he would say, I cannot be sick. My doctor must be wrong. So uh, the su uh, suggested response to just ask him to do everything he can to learn about uh, the disease and research treatment option to discuss with his doctor and ask him to show you and how to read and, and understand your labs and illness. Uh, the second stage, anger. They are questioning why they are chronically ill. The anger can be directed inward or outward, and sometimes they are looking for someone or something to blame. So just ask them to creative activities can help take your mind off your worries and pain, and just find a creative outlet, writing, uh, reading, playing, and so on. And third stage, bargaining. They look for ways to circumvent their illness by bargaining with themselves or, <clears throat> uh, or higher power. They might start questioning choices or actions they believe may have led their illness away. So the same, just filter out your negativity by surrounding yourself with positive people. The fourth stage is depression, feeling of isolation, sadness, and uh, hopelessness. This is a difficult stage. It may lead to potentially damaging behavior like skipping medications or not keeping a doctor appointments. The last stage is acceptance, at last a sense of knowing that although there is no cure of uh, your illness, so we advise him to look for a local support group for a people with diabetes disease or look for a diabetic patients, talk with them about their experience. The second psychological problem is coping with diabetes and diabetes complications. I'm trying to uh, put some, uh, some tips for uh, the physicians who are dealing with uh, diabetic patients in daily practice. They may be used and help the patient to cope, to cope and uh, manage, uh, cope diabetes and manage uh, stress. First one, to pay attention to your feelings. Oh, you are talking about to his feelings. Almost everyone feels frustrated or stressed from time to time. So dealing with diabetes can add to these feelings and make you feel overwhelmed. Having this, these feelings for more than a week or two may signal that you need help coping with your diabetes. The second thing, talk with your healthcare providers about your feelings. Let your doctor, diabetes educator, psychologist, or social worker know how you are being feeling. They can help you to solve your concern about diabetes. Also talk to your healthcare providers about negative reactions other people may have about your diabetes. Your healthcare providers can help you manage feelings of being judged by others because you have a diabetes. It's important not to feel that you have to hide your diabetes from other people. Talk with your family and friends. It's important to tell those closest to you how you feel about having diabetes. Be honest about the problems you are having in dealing with diabetes. Just telling others how you feel will help you will, to relieve the, uh, the, the sum of the stress you feel. Allow loved ones to help you take care of your diabetes. Those also closest to you can help you in several ways. They can remind you to take your medicines, help monitor your blood sugar levels, join you in being, uh, being physically active and prepare healthy meals. They can also learn more about diabetes and go with you when you visit your doctors. Also one of the strategies, do one thing at a time. 
When you think about everything you need to do to manage your diabetes, it can be overwhelming. So to deal with diabetes distress, make a list of all of the tasks you have to do to take care of yourself each day. Try to work on each task separately, one at a time. Also take time to do things you enjoy. Give yourself a break. Set aside time in your day to do something you really love. It could be calling a friend, playing a game with your children, uh, working on a fun project. Just find out about activities near you that you can do with your friends. It is not your fault. Some diabetic patients blame themselves for being diabetic. Some people also blame them. It, it is not your fault. You have been diagnosed with diabetes because your body does not use insulin well. There are many factors that can lead to diabetes. Some you have no control over, like your race, ethnicity, stress, and having close relative with diabetes. While you cannot change those things, you can make lifestyle changes like eating healthy, doing exercise, and losing weight if, if needed. Now that you know you have diabetes, so you can plan your next steps to help manage it and prevent a serious complication. You can live a long, healthy life with a diabetes. You have just been told you have diabetes and you are not sure what the future looks like. That's completely understandable. What you should know is that diabetes care and treatment has come a long way in reducing the impact of diabetes on people's lives. So people with diabetes are living longer, healthy life with a fewer complications if they are well taking care of themselves. So you should know you don't need the special foods. There's no such thing as a diabetes diet. Will most likely tell the patient that you should eat the same way everyone else should eat, eating healthy foods. Every one of us should eating healthy foods low carbs, low sugar, and so on. So you can still enjoy many of the foods that you love and grow up with and manage your diabetes too. Being active helps, as Dr. Ali uh, uh, mentioned yesterday, one of the best ways to manage diabetes is to get regular physical activity. Uh, you don't have to spend hours at the gym and you can start small and take it at your own pace even little changes like taking the stairs instead of the elevator. So regular physical activity has many other health benefits as well, like better sleep, weight loss, stress reduction, and improved blood uh, pressure also. You are not alone. This cannot be said enough, you are not alone. So don't go it alone. It's important to connect with others living with diabetes. Peer support is important. Talk to other people with diabetes. They understand some of the things you are going through. Ask them how they deal with their diabetes and what works for them. They can help you feel less lonely and overwhelmed. Uh, Always, we say, hoping is coping. So your diabetes diagnosis, as we know, may come with a big life changes. It will take time to figure out if you take diabetes care. Just know there are many resources available to help you cope. The main message here is, is don't lose hope. With the right diabetes management plan, you will be able to live your best life while successfully managing your diabetes. The third psychological problem, I want to talk about it, fear of injections and blood glucose testing. The main feature of needle phobia is an anxiety at thought of injections or blood glucose testing leading to attempt to avoid them. Both newly diagnosed and those who have been managing the condition for longer, the injection and blood glucose testing process can be very distressing. So this may be associated with feeling dizzy, lightheaded, dry mouth, levitation, and so on. So how to deal with fear of this fear just by psychological interventions can assist the person with uh, diabetes to develop a fear uh, hierarchy. And also there's a lot of uh, relaxation strategies may help the patient in this area.
diabetes burnout. Diabetes burnout occurs when a person feels overwhelmed by a diabetes and the frustrating burden of diabetes self-care. They start with feeling angry about diabetes, frustrated by self-care regimen and or having strong negative feelings about diabetes, worrying about not taking care of diabetes well enough, uh, it unable and motivated and willing to change, then feeling that diabetes is controlling my life. So feeling overwhelmed and deviated by diabetes, then avoiding any diabetes related task that might give feedback about consequences of poor control, feeling alone, isolated with diabetes, then ends up with diabetes burnout. So it's the diabetes burnout or uh, the patient reached to this stage, it's free distressful emotions and free destructive and have a serious complication of a care. It's different from a uh, feeling of depression. Diabetes burnout uh, centers on feeling focused specifically about diabetes. While depression, affects the person in more broadly psychological ways in which person has negative thoughts about uh, the, the self, about the world, and hopelessness about uh, the future. How to deal with diabetes uh, burnout also by no need for pharmacological intervention, just psychological therapy may help to address issue and help the patient to change his cognitive uh, uh, thought and abnormal behavior related to the, their diabetes and their uh, in their life more uh, broadly. With appropriate psychological support, diabetes-related burnout are treatable and many people go on to make a full recovery. So the last psychological problem is the uh, marital and family problems. As you know, diabetes is a heavy burden for patients and their caregivers. Uh, some diabetic patients may questioning him or herself, am I still attractive to my spouse or partner with this illness? Who is will take care of each other? Or who is will take care of other? So it's really emotionally taxing. So there is a marital uh, change challenges in different aspects, disease related like poor glycemic control, Nocturnal hypoglycemia, diabetes complications, sexual dysfunction, and also social and family disclosing diagnosis very difficult, social and job discrimination, also difficulty in finding a suitable uh, partner <clears throat> on board family support, psychological fear of disease, acceptance by spouse, or a fear regarding satisfactory in sexual life or hypoglycemia. So a supportive spouse may take a primary role in reminding the partner to have a regular medical checkups that generally include screening for diabetes. Supportive marriage may also facilitate the treatment of diabetes once diagnosed. Diabetes regulation and diabetes include <coughs> treatment includes medication, diet, glucose level monitoring, monitoring, and so on. So happy marriage directly promotes self-regulation. <laughs> It may motivate diabetes patient to comply with doctor's recommendations and maintain healthy diet and regular exercise routine all of which promote blood glucose con control. In contrast, marital stress may disrupt adherence to a diabetes management regimen, either by affecting patients on behavior and decision-making or by reducing sp uh, spouses' involvement in patient disease management. So, uh, it's the first part, so we'll go to the second part, how diabetes cause mental health problems. We will talk about um, uh, major depressive disorder. You have to have five out of nine symptoms. Uh, one, at least one of them, depressed mood or loss of interest to diagnose depression. Regarding the prevalence of depression among diabetic patients in Saudi Arabia, on this article published in February 20. 21, it's including a total of 24 studies among different regions and cities from Saudi Arabia with 7,326 uh, uh, participants were included. And the overall prevalence of depression among patients with, type, uh, with diabetes in Saudi Arabia was 38%. So the global prevalence is around 20%. So we are talking about double the global prevalence of depression among diabetic patients. 
Uh, I think one of the factors may affect the result. Most of the studies, it's questionnaire based, just send it to the patient and he will it up and return back to them. So I think this is not the accurate way for uh, diagnose depression. Anyway, this number is alarming. Depression lead to increase of diabetes complication. The mechanisms and pathogenesis underlying the association between diabetes and depression, clinical burden of disease, the knowledge of the diagnosis and burden of managing the condition and its complications are associated with depressive symptom, uh, symptoms rather than biological uh, uh, mechanisms. Lifestyle factors and adherence also are play uh, a role in priming and uh, reinforcing the comorbidity of depression and diabetes. For example, depressed patients are uh, more likely to be sedentary, less active, eat more in an adherence to self-care management. So that will uh, sure will negatively impact on uh, diabetes. Also, antidepressant, uh, uh, we will talk about antidepressant later, but in general, uh, general, in general, some antidepressants have possible effects on diabetes due to their effects on weight and uh, glucose hemostasis. Uh, both depression and diabetes are uh, associated with dysfunction of hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Also, disturbed sleep patterns due to diabetes are associated with depression and We'll talk about how diabetes disturbs the sleep. Uh, environmental factors, including childhood adversity, you know, neighborhood environment, lower social cohesion and poverty, are associated with worse diet and lower physical activity pattern that influence the predisposition to depression and uh, diabetes. Regarding the treatment, you have uh, multiple modalities, psychotherapy like cognitive behavior therapy, interventional psychotherapy, uh, psychotherapy or psychopharmacology. We'll talk about it at uh, the end of the, uh, this presentation. Also, we have uh, other modality like ECT and uh, TMS for resistant uh, cases. <clears throat> so uh, an anxiety, uh, also the association between the anxiety and the uh, diabetes is bi-directional association, like, uh, as like the uh, depression. So diabetes is associated with both elevated anxiety symptoms and an anxiety disorder. Also people with elevated anxiety symptoms may be at increased risk of de developing type two diabetes. So one in five people, five people with insulin treated type two diabetes and one in six with type one diabetes or non insulin treated type 2 diabetes have or diagnosed with an anxiety. So people with diabetes may have concerns related to regularly counting carbohydrates, measuring insulin levels, and they may also worry about short-term health complications such as hypoglycemia as well as long-term uh, effect. Also, diabetic uh, people are at higher risk for certain health complications such as heart disease, kidney disease, and the stroke, uh, knowing this can lead to uh, further anxiety. So for, uh, for, so for some people with diabetes, those concerns are become more intense and result in an anxiety disorder. And at this stage, we uh, have either to refer home to psychiatrist or to start uh, a treatment. Uh, hypoglycemia and panic attack. So one of my patients came to my clinic last week. She's a known case of uh, diabetes. And uh, she had three panic attacks for less than two weeks. Every time they are dealing with it as hypoglycemic attack, just giving her sugar and weight. So she's, uh, she's a student in one of uh, health sciences college. Uh, one of the attack occurred in the hospital and they check for her blood uh, glucose and it is, was uh, normal, so not hypoglycemic attack. After that, they, <clears throat> they, try, they referred her to uh, a psychiatry uh, a clinic. She said, without measuring blood glucose, I cannot differentiate. So uh, panic attacks are very similar to those of uh, hypoglycemia. So not for the tobitin, in your differential and think uh, about it. Sleeping disorder, 
up to one third of patients with diabetes suffer from concomitant sleep disorder. These conditions when associated with diabetes can cause fragmented sleep and poor quality of life. Like Victoria, waking up at night to avoid is a leading cause of sleep disturbance, affecting both sleep onset and maintenance. Also nocturnal hypoglycemia can lead to sleep disruption. And uh, as you know, the most of the hypoglycemic values occur at night, peripheral neuropathy and uh, restless leg syndrome. And there is uh, uh, increased risk for restless leg syndrome in patients with diabetes mellitus and also uh, diabetic patient with RLS also suffer from peripheral uh, neuropathy. So as Dr. Ali mentioned yesterday, yesterday it's very important. The sleep is very important uh, area in management of uh, uh, diabetes. So we need to uh, dig more about the sleep disorder in diabetic patients with other factor, or a factor also like depression may affect uh, the sleep, obstructive sleep, uh, sleep apnea, neuropathy and vein, and uh, the common sleep disorder, we are talking about it. Eating disorder. Some people with diabetes can develop an unhealthy relationship or fixation on food. So it's, it is estimated that up to 30% of people with type 1 diabetes have an eating disorder. And is and five to nine percent of people living with type two diabetes have a binge eating disorder. So having diabetes can mean a bigger focus on diet, weight, and body image. So it is not surprising that some people can start to feel negatively about food. Disorder eating is not the same as having a diagnosed eating disorder, but the signs and behaviors are similar, like skipping insulin for weight loss, binge eating, or making yourself sick, but one can lead to another. So it's really important you get help before things uh, get worse. Over time, eating behaviors like this can lead to eating disorder like anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, or binge eating uh, disorders. So how to recognize an eating disorder with diabetes? So there's some signs if uh, your patient came with one or more of this, so you have to dig more about eating disorder, like increasing hemoglobin A1C or blood sugar levels that are going up and down a lot, uh, going into diabetic ketoacidosis or near DKA episodes, severely restricting what food he or she eat, binge eating, eating a lot of food, very often I'm not feeling in control, secrecy about diabetes management, trying to lose, lose weight by making himself sick or restricting insulin, fear of weight gain, and concerns about body image, depression and anxiety, diabetes distress, feeling of guilt, denial of the seriousness of symptoms and conditions, and exercising a lot without eating enough to balance it out. So the last thing is sexual disorder. There's a lot of studies on uh, this area. I have I found two systematic good uh, good uh, systematic review one on uh, male sexual dysfunctions, including for 145 studies and one in the female uh, sexual dysfunction. Uh, so diabetes may lead to disruption of normal sexual function in both men and women via diabetic induced end organ damage and psychological stress. Erectile dysfunction is the most common in men with diabetes, and the prevalence of erectile dysfunction is approximately three and a half times higher than the general population, and from 35 to 90% of diabetic patients uh, will uh, uh, have a sexual dysfunction in their life. So regarding female patients, in arousal lubrication, and most of the studies on, on male sexual dysfunction, so we need more studies for better to understand the relationship between the diabetes and sexual dysfunction in, in female. So the cause of erectile dysfunction in men with diabetes is, as I mentioned, multifactorial, including neuropathy, vasculopathy, and endocrinopathy. And men with diabetes should be routinely screened for the presence of sexual dysfunction. When I'm searching about um, this topic, I found one of articles they are talking about 80% of diabetic patients they want the, their physician to ask them about sexual 
dysfunction, but no one did. So it's very important to uh, uh, screening for uh, sexual dysfunction with each uh, diabetic patient. Non erectile dysfunction, sexual dysfun dysfunctions are common in people with diabetes, like premature or uh, delayed ejaculation. Medical therapies for erectile dysfunction in men with diabetes are not as successful as in men with erectile dysfunction for other etiologies. And the importance of managing lifestyle factors in treating sexual problems in uh, diabetes. As with most aspects of diabetes care, uh, the uh, lifestyle uh, uh, is uh, factors very important, routine exercise, careful monitoring of glucose levels, usage of appropriate uh, therapies to prevent hyperglycemia are uh, key to prevent the progression of diabetes and use sexual problems. If it is failed, then you can start a pharmacotherapy intervention like misodiastrase 5 inhibitors. So <clears throat> we'll move to the third part of the presentation, how mental health problems may affect diabetes uh, management by non-adherence to medications and self-care, especially we are talking about the psychotic patients or severely depressed uh, patients, all of the psychiatric or mental illness uh, will affect the function and the risk of complications and risk of more early mortality is increased in diabetic patients with a comorbid with uh, uh, mental illness because the non-adherence or social care and so on. So these patients, they need more uh, uh, regular follow-up. Sometimes you need to ask them to bring uh, some of their family with them and they need more uh, and special care. Last thing, psychotropics, medications with diabetic patients. So uh, of course, this is the last uh, nice guidelines about psychotropic uh, medications with diabetic patients. We'll talk about treatment of antidepressant related to diabetes. So um, they are recommended for all patients with diagnosis of depression should be screened for diabetes. And in those who are diabetic, the SSRI is the uh, first line, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the first line for treatment, fluoxetine, uh, it's uh, one of the uh, best SRI medications because it's causes weight loss and then enhanced insulin sensitivity, so improvement in hemoglobin A1C. Also, uh, sertraline and escitalopram. So, uh, fluoxetine and sertraline and escitalopram uh, have the superiority than other SRI for treating depression with diabetic patients. Uh, SNRI are also likely to be safe, but uh, there are uh, pure uh, supporting data about that. Tricyclic antidepressant and monoamine oxidase inhibitors try to avoid with diabetic patients uh, uh, because uh, their effect on weight and uh, glucose uh, hemostasis. Also, monitor blood glucose and hemoglobin A1C <clears throat> when antidepressant treatment is initiated when the dose is changed and after discontinuation. Regarding the antipsychotic, so they are categorizing the uh, antipsychotic uh, based on the risk from high to minimal. So the mechanisms involved in the in development of antipsychotic related to diabetes are unclear, uh, but uh, may include the uh, medication that work on 5-HT2A uh, and 5 h to C receptors antagonism like clozabine and uh, olanzabine uh, have a higher risk than others. Also in direct way by increased plasma lipids weight gain and uh, so on. So olanzabine and uh, uh, clozabine strongly linked to impaired glucose tolerance. So and directly induce insulin resistance. So we try to avoid it with diabetic patients. Moderate risk, cotiabine, risperidone, and phenylthiazines. Cotiabine is uh, commonly prescribed by physicians, not only psychiatrists, for a uh, small dose for uh, insomnia. The uh, good news, the uh, cotiabine risk is uh, dose-related. So uh, the risk increase with daily dose 400 uh, or uh, more 
it's being uh, being linked to change in hemoglobin A1C, low risk like high uh, potency first generation antipsychotic calibridol, minimal risk, and they recommend to uh, start with uh, diabetic patients like aribeprazole, amisulopride, rixiprazole, carbirazine, lorazidone, and uh, zebrazidone. Okay, comorbidity of diabetes and psychiatric disorders are common and can have a different presentation. Both mental health and diabetes can affect each other. Psychological approach can improve therapeutic adherence in diabetes care. Patient engagement and empowerment are essential component of uh, their care. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, uh, uh, for your listening. Thanks, Dr. Abdelaziz, for a uh, comprehensive talk related to diabetic and his psychological impact. I'd like to thank you. And uh, I would like to uh, highlight to all audience who'd like to share his uh, comment or questions. You can write it in Q and E and our speakers happy to answer uh, and to comment about uh, this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abdelaziz. I, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Yahya al -Urkubi. he's a dermatologist, uh, to give us an uh, overview about skin disease and related to diabetic. The mic is for you. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu Dr. You can share your screen and start your talk. Yes. Yes, Dr. It was clear and you can start. First, I'd like to thank the Saudi German Hospital and the organizing committee and Dr. Sever, my colleagues and the attendees for uh, their attending. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the cutaneous manifestations of diabetes mellitus. So I'm gonna give you just an overview. I have no relevant disclosures. Uh, this is the last lecture and uh, dermatology is, uh, uh, is uh, an interesting field. I'd uh, consider this as the desert or the, the, the best lecture of this uh, conference. So uh, why the skin is important in, in diabetes? The cutaneous manifestations of diabetes are important because they are common. It has been reported that uh, uh, cutaneous manifestations appear in about 30% to around 80% of individuals with diabetes mellitus. Also, sometimes the cutaneous manifestations may perceive the disease and signal an underlying disease in those who are not diagnosed yet with diabetes, or it may represent a poorly controlled disease. So it may give you an insight to the glycemic uh, status of the patients, uh, especially in diabetic patients. Uh, also, the awareness of such cutaneous manifestations or signs may help in diagnosing diabetic patients who are not diagnosed yet. Uh, again, uh, cutaneous disease may provide a motivation to patients to better control their diabetes mellitus because they, once they see their skin manifestations improve as they improve or as they control their disease, that will give them more motivation to control their diabetes even more. And lastly, recognition and management of these conditions, uh, of these dermatological manifestations is important in maximizing the quality of life and avoiding serious adverse events in, in uh, diabetic patients. The pathogenesis of cutaneous manifestations in, in diabetes is not quite well understood, but we know for sure that the elevated level of serum glucose may stimulate or may cause direct cell damage, as well as it may cause indirect impairment or damage, especially through advanced glycation in products. And these AGEs, they will directly damage the keratinocytes and the fibroblasts in the skin, resulting in changes in protein synthesis, protein proliferations and migration, as well as collagen in the skin tissues. 
It will also lead to dysfunction in vasodilatation through inhibition of the nitric oxide molecules in the skin. The sugar alcohol sorbitol is usually upregulated in hyperglycemia, which may promote mitochondrial damage and subsequently lead to reactive oxygen species. So in summary, the AGEs will induce pro-inflammatory cytokines and will cause free radical production, causing oxidative stress damage and further reactions with uh, type 1 collagen and epidermal growth factor receptors in the skin, suppressing skin regeneration and healing of the skin lesions. So the cutaneous manifestations, we classify them in diabetes into five categories. The, the, the first class is skin manifestations that are strongly associated with diabetes, and those uh, we're going to talk about in detail. The second class uh, is dermatological diseases associated with diabetes. Those are not specific to diabetes, but they are more common in diabetic patients than in non-diabetic patients. The third class is non-specific dermatological signs and symptoms associated with diabetes. So we see them often in diabetes, but we also see them in other diseases. So they are not specific and they are not uh, uh, at higher rate in, in diabetics. The fourth class are common skin infections in diabetes, especially bacterial and fungal infections. And the last one are cutaneous changes or cutaneous adverse events from diabetic treatment or diabetic medications. So we're gonna start first with the, with the most important one, which is the first class that's strongly associated with diabetes mellitus. And those are six conditions, acanthosis nigricans, microbiosis lipodica, diabetic dermopathy, diabetic foot syndrome, diabetic th thick skin, and bullosis diabeticorum. Uh, the second class, uh, we're going to talk about only one of those, which is basically the generalized granuloma annularum. Uh, psoriasis, like implantis vitiligo, are more common in diabetic patients than non-diabetic patients, but they are not specific to diabetes, so we're not going to cover those. And there are some signs and symptoms. They are not specific to diabetes, but we see them often in diabetic patients like xerosis, which is basically dry skin eruptive xanthomas, pruritus, which is itching, keratosis pilaris, palmar erythema, and yellow skin and nails, among others. The first one of the strongly associated cutaneous manifestations with diabetes is acanthosis nigricans. Uh, and acanthosis nigricans affects men and women of all ages. Uh, it's more prevalent in darker skin people. And it may also present in other in endocrinopathies like PCOS, acromegaly, thyroid problems, basically any condition with insulin resistance. It can be also associated with gastric adenocarcinoma. Uh, on exam or morphologically, you're gonna see hyperpigmented dark brown, thickened velvety plaques in the interterrigenous areas, basically in the armpits or in the axilla and sometimes in the neck. And then you may see them elsewhere like in the dorsal hands and elbows, but you may see them anywhere on the bodies. The pathogenesis, uh, it's mainly due to IGF-1 effect in the keratinocytes and fibroblasts leading to uh, migrations and proliferations of these cells in the, in the upper layers of the skin. The treatment, we can try um, keratolytics or retinoids, uh, chemical peels, sometimes laser treatment, but the most important step in the management is to improve the glycemic control and reduce the insulin resistance. That's the most important step in managing acanthosis nigricans. Also, beside that, it's important in diagnosing some patients who are not uh, yet diagnosed with diabetes. So if you see acanthosis nigricans, you have to rule out diabetes before looking for other uh, etiologies. And these are some examples of acanthosis nigricans. In the upper half of the pictures, these are the most common locations in the axilla as well as in the neck. And uh, in rare occasions, we may see them on the dorsal hands, but that's not the common. Next one is diabetic dermopathy, or we call them shen spots. And it's the most common cutaneous manifestations in diabetes, presents in 40% of patients and results from minor trauma. It has a strong predilection for men and those over uh, the age of years. Although it may, and, to see the, the onset of the diabetes, it's usually a late complication of diabetes and usually with those with microvascular disease. So if you see diabetic dermopathy, you have to look for microvascular complications. Uh, there is a study showed uh, an association with the, with the, with the cardiovascular disease 
uh, it showed that 50 per 53% of non-insulin diabetes mellitus with dermopathy had coexisting coronary artery disease. Also, another study showed that the incidence of dermopathy is around 21% in patients with diabetes with no microvascular complications versus 81% uh, of patients with diabetes with microvascular complications. Initially on the, on the shins or on the lower legs, it presents with round dull red papules to brownish papules that progressively evolve over one to two weeks into well-circumscribed atrophic brownish macules. Normally after two years, they resolve without any treatment. They may leave some atrophy or hyperpigmentations uh, after, after they, they, they heal. Uh, you may see different stages at any point during the stages of uh, evolutions. Yeah. The lesion normally are distributed yeah. over yeah. the yeah. Yeah. of the lower yeah. commonly involved. Sorry, Dr. Hassan, please, can you make your voice uh, mute? These are some examples of, of uh, shin spots or diabetic dermopathies. Uh, on the left, that's an active disease. On the right, that's after healing. You see just brownish and atrophic macules and plaques. And again, you don't need to treat those. They are uh, self-limited after two years. But once you see those, if the patients are not yet diagnosed with diabetes mellitus, you have to rule out microvascular disease. And these are the references for the previous studies that I mentioned regarding the microvascular complications. Next is diabetic foot syndrome. Yesterday, the Dr. al Hayzai talked uh, in detail about uh, diabetic foot ulcers. So I'm gonna talk briefly about the diabetic foot syndrome from the dermatological sides. When we say diabet diabetic foot syndrome, uh, we mean the neuropathic and vasculopathic complications that develop in the feet, not necessarily ulcers, could be any complications on the feet. Uh, it is the most costly complications of diabetes, yet it's the most preventable complication of diabetes. So it's, it's very important. Uh, I'd say it's the most important cutaneous manifestation of diabetes because it's the most preventable. It's a significant cause of morbidity, mor mortality, hospitalization, and it may lead to reduction in the quality of life of diabetes. The incidence is about one to four persons and the prevalence is about four to 10 percent of the population. The lifetime risk of diabetic foot ulcer in particular is about 15 to 25 persons. And the five-year uh, recurrence rate of ulceration in the, in the, in the feet is about 50 to 70 persons. So it's very common and it's very important. Uh, ulcers in the, in the feet in diabetes, it could be neuropathic, which is the most common cause, or it could be mixed, which is the second most common cause. And rarely it could be ischemic. The difference between ischemic and neuropathic, ischemic usually painful uh, ulcers, and usually on the, on the dorsal feet or uh, at the uh, distal part of the uh, feet while the neuropathic usually on the bony prominences of the feet. Diabetic foot uh, syndrome impacts the quality of life. One study showed that um, the impact on the quality of life is equivalent, equivalent to my, my, myocardial infarction and breast cancer, uh, and it may precede 85 persons of the lower limb amputation. So it's a major cause uh, of lower limb amputation in, in diabetic patients. Untreated ulcers usually heal within one year. However, 50% of patients with diabetes, as I said, will have recurrence of the ulcer within three years. So always prevention is uh, much, much more important than treatment. Appropriate screening and subsequent treatment has been estimated to prevent 40% and up to 85% in some studies of amputation. So it's, it's very important to prevent, and if not, to treat at least uh, diabetic foot uh, ulcers. It has been shown that these patients have higher mortality as 50% within five, uh, three years after amputation. Even after amputation, the mortality rate is sometimes up to 50%. And these are some examples. On the left upper corner, these are ischemic ulcers. If you see it's in the distal part of the toes, uh, at the end uh, arteries, 
And then on the, on the right side, uh, on the bony prominence, you will see the neuropathic ulcers. And the lower part of the, of the picture, these are mixed neuropathic as well as ischemic ulcerations. A complication of the diabetic foot syndrome itself or the diabetic foot ulcer itself is secondary infection, which is a serious complication. It's more than 50% of ulcers, they will get infected, which can result in gangrenous uh, necrosis, osteomyelitis, and that will lead to lower limb uh, amputation. Another complications is diabetic neuroosteoarthropathy, also known as charcoal foot, which is an irreversible debilitating uh, deformity of the foot. Uh, or any joints that lead to progressive destruction of uh, the weight-bearing uh, bones and joints. And these are the references for the debit foot uh, complications or ulcerations. Next is scleroedema adultorum of Bushki. Don't confuse scleroedema with the scleroderma. Scleroderma is another disease which is basically systemic sclerosis or localized sclerosis. But this is scleroedema, uh, which is uh, more common in diabetic than non-diabetic. Again, it's one of those that are strongly associated with diabetes. It's a rare disorder characterized by extensive induration. Induration basically means firm, hard skin, tight skin, similar to scleroderma or similar to fibrosis or sclerosis, usually on the back and the neck and the shoulders, and sometimes on the face. Uh, this induration or this firm feeling of the skin is due to dermal deposition of the collagen and mucopolysaccharides. Uh, if you think about it, it's similar to some extent to pretypial myxedema of, of thyroid disease. Uh, again, it's not so specific to diabetes. It's, it's strongly associated with diabetes, but may, uh, you may also see it in other systemic diseases like cancer. So uh, it can be a paraneoplastic syndrome. You may see it also in paraproteinemias and sometimes in uh, infections. About 2.5% to 14% of all patients with diabetes, they may have scleroedema, but over 50% of those with scleroedema present with concomitant, concomitant diabetes mellitus. So it's very important to know. Uh, the pathophysiology, uh, not quite clear, but we know that, that there is some collagen synthesis and fibro, uh, by fibroblasts as well as reduced degradation of this collagen bundles in the skin with subsequent reduction of the skin elasticity, uh, leading to the firm feeling and the hard feeling of the, of, the, of the skin. It has a slow progressive force. The skin sclerosis or fibrosis may lead to joint reduce, uh, reduction in the joint flexibility in the case of finger involvement. The treatment is also difficult, but we can try phototherapy, especially by the use of UVA or ultraviolet type A. We can do physiotherapy for patients with joint flexibility reduction and sometimes systemic therapy with penicillin and some immunosuppressive medications in some uh, uh, patients. And these are some examples. If you see on the left uh, side of the picture, you will see some just diffuse erythema, but when you see some uh, 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 testing on the, on the right side of the picture, he's trying, the, 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 the doctor is trying to pinch the skin, but he cannot approximate his fingers because the skin is sclerotic, hard, and fair. And these are the, 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 the references. Next is limited joint mobility or diabetic uh, chiroarthropathy including deep uh, contracture and carpal tunnel syndrome. The prevalence of limited joint mobility syndrome is about 4% to 26% in patients with di without diabetes, but it's much more common in, in diabetic patients than non-diabetic is about 8%, up to 60% in, in diabetic patients. It presents with progressive flexed contractures uh, we may use two signs, prior sign and table uh, top sign, due to the, uh, the, the, the pathogenesis is basically due to periarticular enlargements of the connective tissue. Prior sign, if you ask the patient to uh, attach their palmar side of, of, of their hands together, if they can do this, then that's negative. If they cannot, then that's a positive sign due to the limitation of the joint mobility. 
patients with limited joint mobility, they may be at increased risk of falls. Again, there is no curative treatments. We can do physiotherapy, we can do NSAIDs to help with that, with that, with the pain associated with the, the, with that, with that, with the mobility. We may also add uh, injections of corticosteroids, and sometimes we may do surgeries. Uh, but the best step in management is to improve the glycemic control as well as regular stretching to maintain and to minimize further limitation in joint mobility. And this is an example of the prior science. Same thing if you apply the, 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 the hand on the, on the table surface, we call it tabletop sign. And these are the references. The next is necrobiosis uh, lipodica. In the past, we call this disease necrobiosis lipodica diabeticorum. But nowadays we remove the, the word diabeticorum because it's not only in diabetic patients, although it's, it's more specific to diabetics, but we may also see it in non-diabetic patients. So it's a rare chronic granulomatous dermatological disease that is seen most frequently in patients with diabetes. Uh, nearly one in four patients presenting with necrobiosis lipotica also have diabetes, but less than one person of patients with diabetes will develop necrobiosis lipotica. So it's strongly associated, associated with diabetes, but it's not that common, it's rare disease. The majority of cases presents years after the diagnosis, so it's a late complication, uh, but it may appear at the time of the diagnosis in around 14 to 24% of, of cases. For unknown reason, it's more common in, in women and in type one diabetes mellitus than others. It begins uh, on physical exam or on morphology with erythematous papules, which evolves slowly into yellowish, brownish, black with an atrophic center and telangiectasia. It's usually asymptomatic, non-proretic, chronic inflammatory, granulomatous disease with uh, a degeneration of collagen. Actually, the, the word necrobiosis basically necrosis of collagen in the skin. Uh, why there is necrosis in the collagen of the skin, we don't know yet. We know that there is a granulomatous reaction. We know it's strongly associated with diabetes, but we don't know what's causing the necrosis or the gran granulomatous reaction in the skin. It may get complicated with ulceration. After prolonged inflammation, it may get ulcerated in one third of, of the lesions. Uh, and if you leave it for a long time, like any other ulcers in the body, it may lead to squamous cell carcinoma uh, after multiple years, after 10 or 20 years, uh, if not treated. The treatment is difficult and sometimes unsatisfactory. So these are some examples of early stages of necrobiosis lipodica. If you see on the, on the pretibial areas, on the lower extremities, you see some erythema and you see some atrophy, but it's not ulcerated yet. So that's the, the, the best time to treat these conditions before they get ulcerated because, because once there is an ulceration, it will get complicated with secondary infection and it will be very difficult to treat. And this is uh, a, a, a moderate disease if you see some early ulcerations in the upper and the lower parts of the plaque on both sides. On the left side, you see a healed, um, well-controlled disease uh, or well-controlled microbiosis lipodica. But on the right side, that's uh, an ulcerated plaque complicated with a secondary uh, infection, basically pseudomonas aeruginosa. And these are some references for uh, necrobiosis lipodic. The next one, we're still in the category that, that is strongly associated with, with diabetes. The next one is uh, bullosis diabeticorum. Uh, usually it's a late complication, usually presents as tense serous blisters, non-infected and not inflammatory without signs of inflammation. The bullies usually are painless, and usually on the lower extremities, especially on the, on the feet and on the bony prominences. It may present as an initial clinical finding of diabetes, but usually it's a late complication. About 0.5% of people with diabetes will develop blistering disease in their course uh, of diabetes. Uh, and the blisters usually emerge rapidly and heal in the course of a few weeks without any treatment. So it's a self-limited condition. 
The pathological mechanism is not completely uh, understood, but if you take a biopsy on the histopathology, you will see some sub-epidermal blistering. You will see a separation between the epidermis, which is the uppermost layer, and the, mid, uh, the middle layer of the skin, which is the dermis. Uh, without any inflammation, if you see an inflammation, you will think about bullous pemphigoid. Again, bullous pemphigoid is a specific entity, is an autoimmune disease, but people with diabetes and kidney disease, they are at high risk of developing bullous pemphigoid. So if the patient has multiple bullae, if the patient has erythema, or if the patient is complaining uh, with pain and itching with the bullae, I will think about bullous pemphigoid. But if it's one solitary bullous that's not inflammatory, that's painless, I will not consider bullus pemphigoid. I'll just think about it as bullus diabetorum. The therapy is mainly symptomatic and consists of preventing secondary bacterial infections and pro uh, promoting adequate serum glucose control. Unless you suspect bullus pemphigoid, then you may need to do a, a skin biopsy or you may need to do a serum bullus pemphigoid antigen measurement. And this is an example of Bullosis David Corum. And if you see it's a serous fluid and there is no signs of inflammation around the lesion itself, and usually on the feet, and usually a solitary lesion. So we finished uh, the, the first uh, part, which is the strongly associated cutaneous manifestations of diabetes. Now we're gonna talk about one of the dermatological diseases that are associated with diabetes. These are diseases we see it in normal people without diabetes, but we see it more often in diabetic than non-diabetic. I'm gonna talk only about generalized granuloma annulari. So there are few types of granuloma annulari, but only the generalized form is the most important one or is the most associated one with, with diabetes. The granuloma annulari is a specific dermatological disease can be seen uh, alone without uh, any association with any other disease. Sometimes we see it in rheumatological diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, but if it is generalized, I, uh, I'll consider diabetes mellitus. The incidence is about 10% to 15% in patients with diabetes, but less than 1% of patients with diabetes uh, will present with granulomatous, uh, with, with the generalized granuloma annulari. And usually uh, it occurs around the age of 15, similar to diabetic dermopathy. It occurs more, more frequently in women than in men and in those with type one diabetes, again, for no uh, unknown reasons. So uh, on exam or on the morphology, you will see groups of skin colored or reddish uh, to brownish, to orange uh, color, uh, fair papules, which slowly grow, and uh, they may involute to form a hypo or hyperpigmented annular rings from the name granuloma, granulomatous, and annulari, basically just a circular in shape skin lesions. The trunk and the extremities are classically involved, usually in bilateral distributions. Uh, usually it's asymptomatic, but sometimes uh, they may have some uh, associated itching or pruritus. Uh, on the histology, if you do a skin biopsy, you will see some dermal granulomatous inflammation surrounding foci of necrotic collagen and mucin. So if you remember, this is somehow uh, similar to necrobiosis lipodica, both they have necrosis of the collagen, but here in the granuloma annulari, we see more collagen and we may see more granulomatous inflammation. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to differentiate the two, but if it's all, all over the body, I'll think about more generalized granuloma annulari. If it's only on the shins or on the pretypial area, I'll think more about microbiosis lipotica. Uh, if I have to uh, differentiate for sure between the two, you need to do a biopsy and see some mucin and plasma cells with generalized granuloma annulari than with microbiosis lipotica. The pathogenesis is not completely understood. It's believed to be unknown uh, stimulus that leads to activation of the lymphocytes. Uh, it has a prolonged and unresolving disease course. Treatment uh, usually is difficult, but we may uh, try anti-malarials 
like hydroxychloroquine, retinoids, corticosteroids, and uh, sometimes immunosuppressives like cyclosporine, methotrexate, and sometimes PUGA, which is a form of ultraviolet life A therapy. And these are some examples. If you see the, the, the picture on the left side, these are just regular or common granuloma annulari. These are not generalized, just uh, three skin lesions on the lower extremities. This could be due to rheumatological disease or it could be idiopathic. But on the right side, if, uh, if it's all over the body, you have to rule out diabetes mellitus if the patient is not known to have diabetes. And these are some references regarding that topic. Next, I'm gonna talk about common skin infections in diabetic patients. And the prevalence of infection is about one in every five patients. So it's quite common. About 20% of, of diabetic patients, they may have some cutaneous uh, infection. Compared with the general population, patients with diabetes are more susceptible to infections and more prone to repeated infections, including cutaneous infections. Why they are at higher risk of infections? We think, or the, 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 the main reasons uh, uh, or the, the, the vulnerability to infection in patients with uncontrolled diabetes uh, include angiopathy, neuropathy, uh, problems in the antioxidant system, abnormalities in the leukocyte adherence, the chemotax, uh, chemotaxis factor, and phagocytosis as well as glucose-rich environments that facilitates the growth of uh, pathogens. So the bacterial infections, we usually see erysipelas and cellulitis in the in diabetic patients, usually on the lower legs. Sometimes we see it on the face. Erysipelas basically just a painful, well-demarcated superficial erythema on the face, usually, but sometimes you see it elsewhere. On the other hand, cellulitis is a deeper cutaneous infection that presents with pain and poorly demarcated uh, erythema, usually on the lower legs. And uh, because it's deeper, it may spread uh, up to uh, the knees and sometimes up to the thighs, if not treated. Uh, folliculitis, which is basically infection of the hair follicle, is also common among diabetic patients. Usually it's bacterial infections, but sometimes you may get fungal infection in the hair follicles. Staphylococcal infection are the most common in diabetic patients, but pseudomonas aeruginosa are also common in diabetic patients. Regarding fungal infections, candida is a frequent uh, complication in diabetic patients. It may involve the mucosa like oral thrush or the vulvovaginitis. It may involve the intertriginous area, basically in the groin and in the axilla. We call it in dermatology intertrigo or erosio interdigitalis or sometimes balanitis. In the nails, we call it nicomycosis. And in the nail folds, we call, we call it paronychia. Uh, mucormycosis usually is uh, a serious infection. Uh, oftentimes with type 1 diabetes mellitus, particularly common in those who develop diabetic ketoacidosis. On the left side, you see an example of uh, cutaneous fungal infection. And on the right side, you see uh, a cellulitis in a diabetic patient due to uh, staphylococcal infection. Next, I'm going to talk about cutaneous adverse events of anti-diabetic medications or oral anti-diabetics. Oral hypoglycemic agents may cause different cutaneous adverse events, such as most of oral hypoglycemic, they may give you uh, uh, articaria or they may cause uh, erythema uh, multiform, and those side effects uh, are uh, self-limited if you stop those oral hypoglycemic agents. Allergic skin reactions and photosensitivity, we see those with uh, sulfonylureas in particular. Uh, also with sulfonylureas, medications, chloropropamide, and uh, others, we may see some maculopapular rash de during the, the, the first two months of treatment. But if you stop the medication, the rash will quickly imp improve. Uh, another important uh, side effect, uh, we see it more often nowadays than previously, is the DPP-4 in, uh, inhibitors. They may give you serious side effects, especially bolus pemphigoid. 
We call it bolus pemphigoid induced BPP uh, for inhibitors. And in rare occasions, we may even see Stevens Johnson syndrome as well as angioedema. So these are very serious and you need to stop the offending medicine uh, as soon as you see some uh, bullae on the skin or as, uh, as soon as you suspect one of those serious cutaneous side effects. Uh, in certain patients with genetic predisposition, chloropropamide may also cause acute facial flushing following alcohol consumption. That's a, a, a particular uh, case uh, in patients who consume alcohol. Uh, another side effects with SGLT2 inhibitor is increased risk of genital fungal infections. So you, you need to keep that in mind with SGLT uh, inhibitor. And this is an example of uh, pemphigoid induced uh, the uh, PPI uh, for inhibitors. And these are some references for the cutaneous reactions uh, following oral anti-diabetics. Regarding insulin, these are very rare nowadays uh, because we nowadays we have the more uh, purified forms than uh, the previous ones. So we don't see any lipoatrophy or hypertrophy anymore. It's uh, it's it's very rare, uh, but uh, these are one of the uh, reported side effects in the past. With the site injection, uh, we may, we may get site injection reaction. Uh, beside those two, the lipoatrophy and the hyperatrophy, we may see some uh, redness, some pain, some itching that are temporary for a few hours and sometimes for a few days. And uh, uh, oftentimes, most people, they will uh, improve or they will tolerate these site injection reactions, especially if they change the, uh, the site from time to time each time they inject. Again, as I said, the lipoatrophy as well as the hypertrophy both are rare with the new purified uh, insulin uh, modern forms. Other complications at the site of the injections, amyloidosis or calcifications. Again, we, we, we rarely see these in, uh, side effects. This is a form of lipoatrophy uh, on the abdomen from repeated uh, injections with the old insulin forms in the past. And these are some references regarding the insulin. Uh, and thank you for your uh, attention. Thanks, Dr. Yahya, for comprehensive overview regarding uh, cutaneous manifestation of diabetic. Uh, it is a pleasure to invite all speakers, Dr. Mohammed, Dr. A I, uh, Dr. Yahya and Dr. Uh, Abdul Aziz, all of us. And uh, I would like to ask about our attendees. If you have any comment, any questions, you can write in Q&A or raise your hand. And the ex our distinguished speakers will answer you and comment your comment. We also uh, would like to welcome Dr. Hassan. He is with us now. Thank you, Dr. Safar. Thank you, uh, my dear uh, friends, uh, the presenters of uh, tonight's uh, session. Uh, we appreciate what you're doing. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the Academic Affairs of Saudi Jama Hospital, we would like to thank you all and uh, special thanks for you, uh, Dr. Safar, for the nice moderation for the sessions of tonight and uh, uh, last night. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Hassan. I, I think uh, once our uh, attendants, they have no comments, I would like because the time of our speakers, I know they are more busy. Uh, I would like to thank all attendants and let us to conclude our sessions tonight and hope we uh, see you again, inshallah, next coming uh, uh, conference or symposium. And thanks. Assalamu thanks. alaikum, Doctor. Doctor, uh, 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 sorry for interruption. 
anyone who wants yes. to, to download the, anyone of the candidates want to, to, to download the, the certificate after one hour inshallah he can make the survey and download the certificate from our platform thanks our uh, technical support uh, is linked regarding this uh, informations i think it is important for all of our uh, of attendance uh, thank you all of you attendees to attend with us tonight which is parallel with the world diabetes day also thanks our uh, speakers and uh, see you coming conference inshallah